Welcome to my pop-up mini-series in which I'll be drawing and painting two very different architectural icons. Now then, how are you doing? I hope you're well. In the first two episodes, I drew a pencil sketch and painted a watercolour of Sydney Opera House. Today, I'm going to look at another very different architectural icon, the Colosseum in Rome. Both buildings present very different challenges. The Opera House is quite a unique beast with a roof that requires a fair amount of care when working out scaling and proportions. The Colosseum, on the other hand, poses a very different challenge altogether. It's round for starters, so perspective is going to be a bit of a nightmare. And it's got lots of arches. Ouch. Well, I'm always up for a challenge, so let's take a look at the great architectural icon that is the Colosseum, which I'm going to begin by sketching in pencil. Visiting Rome for the first time was a memorable experience. As it happens, it was a Sunday, so huge crowds of people had gathered in St Peter's Square to listen to the Pope speaking from the balcony of the Vatican. We stopped by the magnificent Trevi Fountain for a selfie, queued to visit the Pantheon, and made the pilgrimage to view the remarkable interior of St. Peter's Basilica. Rome is simply bursting with notable landmarks, not least the impressive National Monument. Now, I'm a massive fan of the movie Gladiator though, so there was one site I was particularly looking forward to seeing. The Colosseum, of course. Work on the great amphitheatre started in 72 AD and was finished in 80 AD. When it was completed, it could accommodate up to 80,000 spectators. That would have been quite a spectacle. Despite many centuries of wear and tear and the occasional earthquake having taken its toll, the Colosseum is still an impressive sight. I was in awe of it. Drawing something as complex as the Colosseum requires a bit of preliminary groundwork. I have to confess, this was my second attempt after a rather appalling false start. I'm drawing the subject freehand, so I'm prepared for a few minor errors and half-truths. But before I can get into any of the nitty-gritty, it's important to lay down some helpful guidelines. The building curves, which makes the whole thing a little more difficult. So. I've started by laying out something resembling a giant cylinder. There are four sections, or layers, three for the arches and a final top section, all of roughly the same height. This means I'm reasonably safe reducing it down to a simplified grid pattern. Once the curved cross pieces are in place, 
I can split it up horizontally so that I know more or less where the arches are going to go. It's worth noting that despite being curved, a few important rules of perspective still need to be observed. Most notably the fact that the arches as they recede away from us will appear to get smaller and closer together. So my little boxes need to reflect that. The longer you look at old ornate architecture, the more you see. I'm still breaking things down, adding to my grid, but I am increasingly aware as I do so of the masses of tiny ornamentational elements visible. And I know that I'm going to have to make a few tough editing decisions as I go along. I'd already started adding the arches, for instance, before I realised that each one mustn't take up too much of its segment of the grid. Adding a few more curved lines parallel to the initial ones should help to take care of that. Once I'm happy with my lightly drawn draft, I can start working my way around some of those outlines, intensifying them and also roughing them up a bit as I go along. The reason I say roughing them up a bit is because this is an ancient building, so it won't do for it to look too clean. I don't want it to look like a new build. In fact, I would say wobbly lines should be the order of the day. You will also notice as I go along that I'm starting to add a few of those smaller details. Little ornamentations along the underside of the ledges, for example. They're not going to amount to anything more than a series of wiggles in my rendition, but the point is I add them as I notice them. Well, there is always a potential problem of cluttering up a drawing with too much information. If we go down the line of the more we see, the more we include, then it follows that restricting the time we spend on a sketch might be a good thing. I'm also always keen to recommend taking lots of breaks during drawing and painting sessions. That way, if we walk away from our artwork, have a cup of tea and then return a short while later, there's a greater chance of being able to see our work with a fresh eye. That way we can control our details and hopefully see any major errors before they become less easy to repair. I always think that it isn't until we attempt to draw something that we really start to understand it and also realise just how much we take for granted or just don't notice in the space of a passing cursory glance. I hadn't noticed the columns between each of the arches, but there they are, clear as day. I should say that I'll be following this up by painting the scene in watercolour. I mention it because the level of detail will not be nearly as great as it is with my pencil drawing. It's also worth saying that when I start a drawing, although I may have a rough idea of what I'm aiming for, I don't really know where the drawing is going to take me until I get there. In that respect, I never find drawing or painting boring. The process always excites and interests me. The journey is the thing that keeps me hooked. Or maybe I just need to get out more. It seems I managed to get a little carried away and overreached with the pattern, hence the need for some repair work. Whilst there is clearly an ongoing repetitive pattern to the Colosseum, this is a point where that pattern breaks up and the arches to the far right are slightly set back from the main facade. Well, these are the crucial moments when it's easy to misinterpret our source material. 
The lesson I learned from this is that you can't have too much information. When visiting a new location, particularly one that we're unlikely to be returning to anytime soon, it's important to harvest as much information as possible. Take the time to look at your subject from as many different angles as you can and back up those observations with either a few sketches if you have a sketchbook and pencil handy or with photographs. Fortunately, the days of having no camera about our person are mostly long gone since most of us carry a smartphone. Even if the camera on your phone isn't the best, it'll almost certainly be good enough for reference purposes. It's been a long journey, involving many columns and arches, but I'm finally at a point where I can start applying some shading to the building. Well, this is a relatively straightforward process, in which I'm acknowledging the fact that the light is coming from the right, so most of the shadows are down the left-hand side. Well, you may have noticed that I've placed a sheet of paper beneath my wrist. This is simply to protect the drawing. Without that sheet of paper, there's a good chance I'll end up smudging it. In pencil drawing, as with watercolour, we work from light to dark. Tone is also relative, which means that the lighter and brighter we want an object or element to appear, the darker the neighbouring element needs to be. Which brings me to the darkest, most intense tones. Most of these are on the undersides of the arches and the spaces leading to dark places beyond the arches on the lower levels. Dark tones in pencil drawing are created by applying greater pressure with the pencil and a tighter shading pattern. It's also worth saying that, as with watercolour, if you're not happy with the intensity of your tone, then all you need to do to make it darker is to go over it again, or maybe two or three times until the required value is achieved. I should also say that dark tones do have a tendency to draw attention to themselves, so pick them out with care. Don't be afraid to leave a few out if it helps to concentrate the eye on a particular part of your composition.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that. There's no doubt about it, the Colosseum is a mighty subject indeed. I think I'm probably as pathologically averse to buildings with lots of arches as I am to buildings with lots of windows. Large stately homes bring me out in a cold sweat. I know, call me strange. Having said all that, I'm reasonably satisfied with my result and I'm ready and raring to move on to the next stage. I'll be doing that next time in the final episode of this series. Well, join me next time then when I'll be painting the Colosseum in watercolour. See you very soon. Take care.